I wanted to do something more directly helpful to the world. Regenerative farming came up on my radar. I'm going to work with my hands. I want to help people. Like this is this is the thing. Okay, Ryan. So thank you for coming by. Um, what are we doing with your hair? Oh, right. <laughs> that's that's why that's one reason why we're here. Seven on the side. Okay. All the way up. All the way up. Or, or like high. Okay. You know, high go high with the seven and like not flared, like straight Wait, sides. I'm gonna probably give you bad news. I actually don't have a seven. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I do anything over a two. I do. Oh, with oh, great! Scissors and comb. Okay, great. I was showed how to do men's haircuts with only scissors and combs. That's all the better. So I can get something really, really tight. It's all the better. And anything lower than that, that's when I go to like a one, a half, and then yep. flippers where it's like skin face. Seven's not super tight. No, it's not. That's what I'm saying. I'm like seven. It seems like almost not anything sticking out of my fingers for the yeah. most part. What do you do with your hair, Ryan? You I mean, shower, you're, your you're wet. You yeah. Do? I mean, you're looking at it like I, I get out of the shower, dry, and then I just kind of like, and that's it. You put any product in. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Easy. Yep. Do you wash your hair every day? Yep. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you're not finding that your hair is getting dry and your scalp is not showing any sort of signs of, yeah. um, you know, anger, that's what I, I would say, then I think you're fine. If yeah. you're sweating a lot, yeah. you're drenched in sweat, I think it's a good idea to clean your scalp. Mm -hmm. You're also not trying to grow your hair long like mine, where the amount of shampoo could be drying, and then uh, you would definitely need out conditioner, right? Uh, but you're keeping your hair short. When I kept my hair short, I probably wash my hair like every two, maybe three days. Mm -hmm. And I was in the gym sweating, drippy yeah. butts. And, I, and then sometimes during the summer, if I was working out, going in the ocean, going in pools, then I was washing yeah. my hair once or twice a day. Right. And again, when I was keeping my hair short, it didn't matter. Right. Because if it got dry, it was just getting cut off anyways. Right. Now that my hair is longer, I'm very particular about how much I'm shampooing because I don't want my hair to get dry. I have always um, shampooed every day, but then like, I'm a, you know, I'm a bit of a camper and a hiker and stuff like that. Whenever I do that and I go a week without showering, it, I come back and like my skin's amazing, my hair's amazing, mm -hmm. like my eyes are glowing. Like I'm like, what? Something just happened. I don't know what happened, but I don't know if the shower has something to do. So when I get back to the rhythm, I feel like I'm selling myself short because if I committed to just not mm -hmm. washing so much, there's yeah. actually some some natural mechanism that takes over that keeps yeah. things in good shape, right? But for now, I'm just an everyday shower. Hey, you, you, you could start today by just not needing to do it from here on. <laughs> I know what you're saying. I, I remember reading some some idea, I forget what it was, you know, because I love uh, fringe medical and health stuff, right? It's like one of my favorite things to read about. When I say fringe, it's just not mainstream. They're talking about like after you've been out in the sun, that in the next 24 hours or so after you've been exposed to the sun, right. that you need to let it, like that's really when the yep. absorption of vitamin D happens. That too. And it, and it, and it made me go like, man, so what happens is like, I think the problem is, is that you're trying to wash the chlorine off your body. Is it that's any green? So, unless you're in like a salt water pool. And yes. With that. Right. But if I'm in the ocean, which is very rare these days, being that I'm in Texas, mm -hmm. the ocean is four hours away. Mm -hmm. But if I was like tubing in a lake and I've been out in the sun, I'm probably not going to want to rinse off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that, let the, let the good stuff in. Let the good stuff in. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're going to leave this on the shorter side. And then on the top here, just, you know, you push it over with your hands mm -hmm. like this. Yep. You don't put a clean part in? No. Cool? No. And then uh, I'm assuming you don't want like a really hard to find neckline. Just kind of keep it natural. Yeah, I have like a, you know, I have like a cowlick back here. Yeah. And they, yeah, it, it goes, people always kind of fuss, up, fuss with it. Up, and then it goes down. So it's kind of like whatever makes it easier for you to tend to that area. I come down to it. I have a couple of clients who have necklines like yours, and it's actually not difficult. I've always said hair isn't difficult. It's sometimes the people it's on it's where the difficulty cool. lies. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, well, these sides aren't even. I go, well, your hair, it looks right. even. Right. And it's right. styled out. And that's what matters to me is you looking good. So Sounds uh, good. Cool. Love your you attention to detail. Well... <laughs> I'm just absolutely neurotic. That's all. You know, I'm 45 years old. I've gotten a lot of haircuts. And I feel like every time I sit down in the barber chair, I don't know what to tell the person. The last barber I had said, 
you know, tell him seven all the way up. Yeah. Hey, he <laughs> Straight so. size, no flare. I'm like, okay, this is my, this is my new, you think I had, had figured out what I want. I think a lot of people know what they want. They don't know how to communicate it. And then another thing that I find happens, a lot of hairdressers don't ask questions. Mm. They don't ask you like, well, what is the yeah. you didn't like about your Yeah, hair? yeah. Like, so oh, that's good. I know lots of hairdressers will say, seven, got it. And they, they don't yeah. ask you why it's seven. Right. I'm going to ask that I'm getting closer to when you cut your hair. Like, what is it that a seven gave you that you like that you enjoy? Like, yeah. What was those features and benefits right. to you that you enjoyed most? Oh, yeah, I love it. You like it to be square. It's which more, you could do that's that the big like. Yeah, right? that's the biggest thing. But that's the biggest feature for me. I think you know, this girl that I was getting my hair cut with last that I was happy with had just kind of like she wasn't great at communicating, but just she had really great intuition and it's just like it just came out looking great that's awesome and so i was trying to say like what what did you do i think she was partly coming from like the maybe the level of thinner thickness on top yeah that like keeping everything a little longer looks better yeah. and if i go too short i think that's where it came from. when i'm teaching hair cutting and especially uh when i would teach men's cutting courses the question would be like well what do you do if somebody starting to thin yeah the density i go yeah. i want to match the density Sometimes that means taking it shorter on the side mm -hmm. to make the density look fuller on top. Ah, yeah, there you go. Other times it may be keeping everything a little bit longer. Right. I go, but we have to do our job to explain right. why we want to right. do this to our client. Because I think at the end of the day, most men who may be thinning or starting to show signs of it, they just want their hair to look like they have hair. Yeah. They're game for whatever. Right. So I have a, a, a guy and, and his hairline comes back like a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Thick curly hair. Good. And I said, well, if we cut this part short and you just kind of smash it around, it'll make your hairline look straight. Mm -hmm. He's like, but isn't that part shorter? And I go, do you want to look like you have hair or not have hair? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's what I was asking. Yeah. And he said, I want to look like I have hair. So we did it. He goes, oh my God, I look like I have hair. And he's always in the water surfing. So when he comes out of the water, he needs something to just air dry. Right. And I go, when you have that long piece in the front, it hangs down here. Now your hairline to somebody's looking like Eddie Munster. Right. Your hairline's starting here and they just see it go back. Right. But that's not the reality. They see flip dry eyes. So, uh, so Ryan, fill me in. Tell me about you. I own a regenerative farm. It's called Geosman Regenerative Farm. I started three years ago. Completely, I was moving, you know, in a completely different direction. Uh, we were on a completely different career trajectory. I was tired of what I was doing and I wanted to do something more directly helpful to the world. Regenerative farming came up on my radar and I said, uh, I'm going to work with my hands. I want to help people. Like this is, this is the thing. It's been like years of kind of studying and getting ready to do that, make this transition. Mm -hmm. And then about uh, two and a half years ago, I started this business and started raising chickens in my neighborhood in South Austin. You know, about a year ago, I fully left the old career. Still like right in the middle of this major life transition. Trying to serve myself and serve the people by like doing something, you know, constructive. What is it that um, is beneficial for the general public about regenerative farming? As somebody who's a consumer, yeah, because I don't do any farming, right? right? I have some understanding of farming in the sense that growing up, one of our family friends were organic farmers. Mm -hmm. So when I was a teenager, Aunt her, I mean, uh, Martha, that was our family friend, she would grab all the vegetables and stuff that she would be harvesting. Right. Straight out of the ground. She put them in a little basket and with dirt, probably yep. still the bugs from the dirt, just right on our front porch. Right. And then she'd go to the farmer's market yeah. and then she would sell it. Like she would sell everything just straight out of the ground, which I thought was cool. But I remember broccoli tasting very different. And this is before organic farming being mm -hmm. something that you could just get at a normal yeah. stream chain grocery. Mm -hmm. You had to go to a farmer's market or then with a small boutique organic farmer's markets where, you know, you're buying like, you know, beef tallow of this and beeswax yeah. that. And now those are becoming more mainstream too. But what I'd like to know is how did you get into regenerative farming? What were you doing before regenerative farming? Yeah, yeah. And what did that cause this this shift? Yeah, no, I was like a starving artist. It was, uh, I was a filmmaker. I was following that passion. I was like, wow. I was already kind of doing something that was like, you know, not normal. I learned even more so as I got into it that like you, you really, there's like two or three people in the world that get to make personal art and like get paid for it. 
even my heroes, like they're fighting and they're working second jobs and whatever to like make their like good indie film that gets out and actually gets seen and whatever. It's, it's just like a, it's just a fallacy that you can like actually get out in the world and be making a living, making personal art in the film world. Oh, I agree. I think that's with all arts. Yeah. So, so I just like, you know, I wanted to make films that were personal and like helped the world that is, that had, they film had, um, you know, it had been a big part of my growth, my emotional growth, my spiritual growth, my career growth. And it was like, okay, I was doing the starving artist thing. I was working successfully as an editor and I was trying to make my films and I just had spent years doing that. And I got eventually up to the point where I had kids and I started, you know, this is around like COVID and it just was like a time to like kind of, oh, I wasn't able to really follow my, the, the artist part of this whole thing. Now I just have the like career part I'd built. So now I'm just an editor. I'm not like Ryan, the filmmaker slash editor by day and personal filmmaker by night. And so it was like, for the first time, I was like, oh, wait a minute, like I'm making reality TV shows and political ads is really all I'm doing. This is not satisfying. You know, I was looking for something else. I was looking to work with my hands because I'm kind of a physical creature and I like working with people. And I was doing a lot of just sitting on my chair and to whatever degree, like working in, you know, craft like that is probably a lot of people's dream you get told what to do you sit at the computer alone for a long time you work your you know you really put your heart and soul into stuff and then you hand it off to somebody and you're lucky if you get any feedback not only does the end user not sit there with you and you don't get to sit in a darkened theater and like all have an emotional experience and then get up and like clap together and talk about it like that happens once or twice in my whole career it was awesome that's not my life so it's like a lot of handing stuff off to people never hearing again it's like crickets i do feel like a lot of people's have that issue in their in their life that was my experience in the in the art world in the film world i wanted something that i was going to get direct feedback i wanted something where i knew i was being helpful from a totally different direction i was interested in gardening i was interested in um permaculture and you know why permaculture what's that i've never heard that term um it's like uh it's kind of like it's the foundation of regenerative ag it's it's like perm- permaculture like how to survive on this planet permanently it's like okay. you can grow you can pull energy from the wind that's blowing by, by by building turbines. You can pull energy from water that's falling down your property. If you live on steep hills, you can pull energy from that. There's resources all around you yeah. all the time. So I was gardening and got into like these uh, these ideas that like, you know, like in Austin particularly, like you see the sun just like beating down on the ground all the time, burning out the soil. And like, it's like, okay, wait a minute, the sun is a resource and there's tons of extra sunlight. Like, what do we do? Why are we not harvesting all this energy and somehow like turning it into plant matter or something like there's just all this wasted. So that's kind of what permaculture attracted me. It was like, oh, it's teaching you like, um, if you, instead of leaving bare soil in your garden, you have like, don't even weed your garden, like grow your tomatoes and let all the weeds and stuff grow up around it. Whoa, whoa, because whoa, whoa. what you're doing, what are you doing? Cause that's weird. Like that goes against everything. Cause what you're doing is if you leave space in the soil, you leave the soil exposed, you're actually causing more direct sunlight to hit the soil, which the soil doesn't like. It heats up, kills the microbes and you're going to have to water it more, right? If you're low on rain, high on, on sunshine, grow all the other plants around it. Let them shade the, su- the soil out. You don't need to water as much. The soil's not protected, it's healthier. When the water actually does come, come you're actually able to absorb what's there. I need to write a letter to my HOA. I know, I know. No. How weeds are so entrenched. Maybe beneficial yeah. to that overall water table right. of, of, of our neighborhood. That makes way more sense. Yeah, 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 I know, it's but such a shame. I'm just literally trying to wrap my head around a weeds serve a purpose. Why weeds, right? There's, there's a song from a band called Not A Surf. And there's this really great lyric. He said, you know, we, uh, flowers are just pretty weeds or something to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that stuck with me. And I go, wow, isn't it weird that all these things grow out of the ground? And if you didn't know what a weed was and what flower was, you would just look at it and go, they're all the same. But we made this distinction between. Yeah, totally. Well, these, yep. we value totally. their aesthetic, so they're pretty, but these yeah. other things. They all have a different purpose. Like if you treated the same piece of land, like, Four different ways. So if you have a piece of soil and you and you drive a car over it, compact the crap out of it, and you have another piece of that same soil and you like stick a pitchfork in it and fluff it up, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you know, so you do like four different versions of that kind of stuff, and then you just like let it sit. You'll get 
four different swatches of weeds and four different swatches of, of biology will start to grow there because why? Like the compacted stuff needs decompaction. So what grows there is some sort of weed that has like a really deep taproot that will break up the soil and kind of pull minerals up from the bottom. Right? Uh, if it's like too fluffy, you'll get these fluffy kind of light, hairy roots that will start to reconnect in the soil and kind of pull it back together. Like, so all of these different- Fix the soil. All of it has purpose, right? All of nature has purpose. And so you can sort of learn how to like stimulate and make different things happen, or you yeah. can learn how to like look at what's happening and like support it. And that's kind of the basis for regenerative ag is like- um, Nature already has a solution. Nature has done this for years, built built uh, soil at the same time that it grows plants, at the same time that it grows f animal flesh. Mm -hmm. Abundance, like, uh, you know, what is, what is, it's not a zero sum game. It's like, it's abundance in every quadrant if you kind of tap into the natural cycles, you know? I was getting into these concepts from permaculture and gardening. And it's not in the East Coast? No, this was here. I moved here in 2011. Okay. But it was about maybe about like seven years ago now, I'd say seven or nine years ago, nine years ago. And um, when my kids were born, yeah, so nine years ago. And then I found regenerative ag was this thing. It was like, it was capturing those principles of like utilizing nature's cycles and nature's resources, but it was combining them with like independent farming and, uh, and, and running a business like, like commercial farming on a small scale, running a business. And I was like, damn this. Okay. I don't, I'm not a homesteader. That's not me. I wish I could be, but, um, my wife and I jokingly say that we're like we can't work on homesteaders. Or I, <laughs> I call it homesteading in an HOA. Like we're <laughs> like everything we can without actually it. having That's the brutal. land. Like we buy einkorn berries. Nice. And then we mill the einkorn berries to make bread. Not bread. That's beautiful. You know, people are like, what do you use? Like einkorn. Like, what is that? Yeah. And I'm like, it's an ancient grain. And then I sound like a crazy person nice. talking about how the gluten content is yeah. they're freaking yeah. up yeah. Yeah. protein yeah. and and then, I, then I, I lose them at that point. They're like, so it's gluten, so I can't eat. And I'm like, yeah, you're gluten. If you're celiac, you can't have any gluten. But if you're sensitive, you're probably going to like this because it doesn't have the folic acid that it's sprayed with. It's, you know, all the other shit. Nice. Yeah. I can guarantee you right now, I just lost probably about half of everybody. It like, oh, what the fuck is I? No, 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 no. They probably think it's a corn. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so you're not homesteading at this point. No, but it was just... It was the way that I could, like, I would love to go off and be a homesteader, but like, I don't know how, I don't have the wherewithal in the like experience on the land to just like go make that happen, right? Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the suburbs. Me too. No farming background, you know. What I saw was like, oh, there's guys, there's a few guys, Joel Salatin, uh, Richard Perkins, there's a few guys that are doing this. And they're first generation farmers too. And they now have a lot of experience doing regenerative and they're like leaving the trail of red comes behind the recipes for like how to do this. What I found was like, there's a roadmap and it's like that version of regenerative ag of kind of just like raising, you know, of just a few thousand chickens a year, not like tens of thousands of chickens a year hundreds of thousands of chickens a year. Like that's something I can do myself, you know, and then grow into maybe having a small team, but I don't have to like have spent a whole uh, generation or two, like learning how to, you know, drive monster tractors and have like hundreds of thousands of acres and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, like I can do that, this type of farming. You could also just have horses pull stuff too. I love then, you have to, then you don't have to worry about the gas or the diesel driven under the soil. Heck yeah. It's trip here. Heck yeah. Uh, that's what Young Living Farms does. The right. house in Utah, they have these horses, what they're called pairing dowels or something, like a big, yeah. they're, they're bigger than a Clydesdale. Yeah, oh geez. Clydesdales are massive, right? Yeah. These are bigger. And that's what they do to till the land. They just pull. Yes. They don't even want gasoline. Yeah, that's crops. beautiful. And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is what it's yeah, about. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah, that's awesome. This is interesting. So you're doing this, uh, you're doing this, life switch at this time yeah and it, did it did it was it a conscious thing where you said like okay i need to get out of what i'm doing because the my soul if you want to use that term right is not being fulfilled yeah like financially we're being fulfilled there's stability in our life but i am not yeah whole. that is definitely true and that's like i felt called like that when i got into film but i you know found myself in those in a different reality as I 
uh, got 10 years deep into the career. I felt called to this farming thing. I was already putting a lot of time into like gardening and this kind of stuff. So it was like, I was not my, like in film and particularly in the, in this version of it that I was working in, everyone's freelance. And so there isn't a lot of like job stability in the first place. The income is good, but you do go from job to job and there's times where you're without work and that's part of the rhythm. But it's like, there's always this sense of like, you know, something might never show up ever. And I have to go, you know, drive a cab, like a, a Uber, like, you know, that's just part of like living as a contract work. And so um, that had never been the case. And like, I came to get very used to living that way, but it was already, you know, there just, there wasn't the same kind of security as if I worked for corporations. Well, yeah, and then yeah. on top of that, it was like a young man's game. You're like, you know, I quickly saw that like the older I got and the more experienced I got and the more I charged for the work that I did, the more that like you had to find just the right fit to get work. And a lot of people are getting like work right out of, schools and they don't really know what they're doing, but they're willing to work cheap and they can work kind of fast and dirty. Saw so like job security, like that I was kind of uh, aging myself out of like a lot of work already. And especially now with AI. Oh, with yeah. Oh, editing. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> there, there's AI yeah. editing programs. Oh, God. Specifically a podcast. Oh, my God. I want to test out. I don't think it's going to be my result, but I'm like, man, I, I'm wondering if somebody like me, a small you know, creative yeah. entrepreneur with the podcast space. I'm like, could I shave off four or five hours oh my God. per episode of editing? And if that's the case, why would I not want to do it? Yeah, that's crazy. You know, with because this, it would, with, yeah, with podcasts, person. with podcasts, that would work fine because it's all dialogue based, you know, but if, if you're, if it's a visual and dialogue, I do not understand how a computer could possibly figure that crap out, but it'd be cool to see. It, it, it runs off of um, the audio. Like if you had a mic and I have a mic, then what happens is when you talk, yeah, it cuts no, the switch. audio right. is, is connected to a different right. video. And so it is That's you listening the audio trigger to go through and yeah. do stuff, right? right. I, I have very contrarian views right. of uh, AI and creative stuff. And yeah. I, I have a few friends that we have kind of this coalition where we're, we're the outliers of our views on AI, but we also have very similar views on AI on other forms mm -hmm. integrating into our lives negatively mm -hmm. right so uh, uh that's a whole another person uh -huh. conversation because we're talking about regenerative farming <laughs> <laughs> i've got a canon 5d at home myself here and you've got a nice setup got, thanks man I, I see you've gotten some you know you've got the bounce cards going over here this is like this is someone has introduced you to how to light i think i um i was gonna go to call for photography yeah so i have um an interest clearly in photography. Yeah. Film is something new to me. Sure. However, between life drawing and painting and doing photography, the one thing I feel is that light is light. No matter what you do, light right. works. Yep. The same way. Right, right, right. You know? And if you can understand lighting, you can you get you understand most of it, right? Yeah. The where light goes or how it falls is one thing, but how do you capture that, right? So it's a it's it's a lot of math, right? So it's like figure out the intensity of the lighting right. and the distance. And then that controls like your shutter speed, your f-stop, your ISO, right. right, and all that. I was just trying to find something where I just didn't want it to look like it was shot in a studio. It's I've turned a room into more of a studio, but I wanted it to not have. That's the other thing too. Is and this is just I'm on random real quick, but like if when I look online, there seems to be a podcast visual format that everyone mm. follows. Mm. And so if everyone is shooting on the same Sony, using the same filters yeah. and using the same orange to teal color scheme, because right. I love the Matrix and God knows what I like in the Joker. Right. If you're, which are great loots by the way, but like if, if you're following the spell app, because that's how everything looks, it's really unique. It right. may be unique if you're comparing it to like a sitcom. Right. You know, if you're watching like an old episode of Seinfeld or more recent mm -hmm. sitcoms, I don't even know what they are. I remember watching them. It's going to look different. Yeah. In the podcast world and like those YouTube channels, they all have the same stuff. Right. And so you have the same format. So like, could I be using a 4K or 8K camera? Absolutely. Right. But then I feel I'm going to get lost in the right. mix. <laughs> the reason I'm shooting vertically. Nice. Like, I, I'm yeah. just, I, I don't care. I believe a lot of doing to a point where I sound crazy, but yeah. I like, I'm doing this because I believe in nice. this creative thing. That's awesome. But yeah. I, I see it. It comes through. It's beautiful. Thanks, man. And I think creative people 
may end up getting into other creative passions. And I think creativity, you know, like we need to be stimulated. If you're a, a creative artistic individual, you need a lot more stimulation than average. And mm. I, I, I just, I think about it. Cause when I talk to other creative people, there's a reason there was that term Renaissance. Yeah. Like a Renaissance period, like where these individuals, these Renaissance men of the time, they weren't just narrow focusing on right. thing. They were interested in so many yeah. things. Which if you want to like fast forward to more of a recent thing, it would be like the school Baja School of Art and Design. Hmm. We're like, yes, yeah, so you have one person studying architecture, but they mm-hmm. also had to understand a little bit of music, they had to mm-hmm. a little bit of typography. Mm-hmm. And I think people mm-hmm. like you who are clearly creative. You found an interest in working with your hands. Which yeah, it's not surprising. There's a great, great hairdresser named uh, Christian. He's this Dutch hairdresser, and he's really good at woodwork. Mm. Like insane. Right. You would never think that, but yeah. you know, I love working on muscle cars. And everyone's right. like, "We're us." Yeah. And I'm, well, I can tell you, the thing I know from hairdressing to woodworking and mechanics is we're all using our hands. Yeah. You're using yeah. your hands to edit. It, yep. But now you're using your hands to totally. Edit yeah. It's, yeah. Like a cross training. Yeah. I've never been as satisfied like really when i when i made my own films and we were in production that was incredibly satisfying like i used every morsel of my spirit and body to like get through those times and you know it's kind of like preparing for war or big game or something like that you just enter into that phase of production and you are just going 110 percent for months and it's really fun and like you're doing it collaboratively with a whole team it's like it's a beautiful thing but it's few and far between as i said before you can't it's really tough to make money doing it what kind of films were you doing if you don't mind asking well like my personal filmmaking preferences were like narrative like dramas i was really into uh i'm really into paul thomas anderson like I'm really into stim stanley kubrick and, and like terrence malick uh um dave lynch you know those kind of folks what about gus van sant when you said um, when, when i think of like a true when i not true but when i think of uh what people think of that artists making yeah. movies i'm like to me, Gus Van Sant is mm. the epitome of like artsy fucking film. Yeah. Because you're walking away going, that was fine. get it? Uh-huh. Or you don't, and right. David Lynch is another one of those. Like, those two to me are like, yeah. you you yeah. either love her or you hate her. Yeah. And yeah. that's good art to me. Yeah. 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 If you walk away going, eh. Yeah. Bad art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I get, yeah, I agree. That's, you know, and I think the, yeah, Lynch is kind of like, there's, whether I know what to do with it, whether I enjoyed it or not, there's like, there's, there's soul to it. There's resonance to it. And when I walk out of there, I'm like, whoa, I just like, my body just had an experience. Like I feel elevated. I don't know what the hell that was. Or sometimes I do know what it means, but it was like, you know, that, that was like, that resonated. But yeah, I mean, all that is to say that like the level of satisfaction and, um, what like use of all my faculties that I'm feeling now that I'm like running my own business out there, working the fields, moving the chickens around, you know, kneeling in chicken poop every day. And <laughs> chickens it's, are disgusting. It's crazy. Like the level of creativity and imagination, organization and problem solving, just the number of things that you have to like manage and do to run a business like this. Uh-huh. I'm like, I've never been as satisfied in my life. You know, some of it's very solitary in the field by yourself. And then when you go to the farmer's market on Saturday, it's like, woo, you get to like tell everybody what you're doing. You hand them the product. They're happy that you're out there doing it. I'm happy that they're buying it. And it's like this very beautiful, mutual like appreciation. And all of this stuff is also very um, fundamental. Like growing stuff out of the soil is very fundamental. And going to the market and exchanging goods is like, it's a long held tradition that feel that way i'm down in the middle of a square downtown and it's like yeah this has been going on for a long time and there's a reason why we do it this way you know i think it's great that you're uh, that you brought that up because i i always talk about the desire to be connected to other people yeah is i think an essential essential human need yeah even though people may be uh anti-social there still is this desire at some point in that year yeah. that they want to physically be connected. To yeah. People. I met you through our mutual friend, Arturo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he, um, him and I were in a party and I was telling him about the podcast and I told him how I had, his name's Jeff Nunley. He is an advocate for 
South Texas cotton farmers. And I was talking about that. And I, and I said, I would love to get more into the world of farming. He goes, I got a guy for you. Nice. He's a regenerative chicken farm. I think it was like a day later, the group tech started between. Yeah. And I, nice. And apart from the fact of like how it's better for the earth, which I don't, I would like you to go into that. Yeah. Because I want to know more about that. Yes. My friend is, I have another chef friend and he was saying, it's like, you know, support your local, local farmer. And he goes, and if he's like regenerative is always better. Yeah. And I didn't feel it was the right place for me to ask him. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a better time for me to ask you. Yeah. Why is regenerative farming better yeah. for me? Yeah. Who's eating this product? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Like when you're farming regeneratively, you are healing the soil and you're healing the environment while you're growing food. You're putting resources back into the ecosystem. But at the same time that you're doing that, you're also giving the animal its actual like best light. So you're giving it, if it wants sun and air and grass, that's what you're giving it, sun and air and grass. And if it likes to move in herds and, and not stand in its poop all the time while well, you're giving it the opportunity to do that right by allowing it to like live the way it wants to and the way nature wants to you end up with a like more happy healthy nutrient dense product in in the end that's also good for you the end user to eat so what happens is it's like there's more nutrients because they've eaten better forage. There's more minerals because the minerals are like cycling through the land in a way that they didn't if they're all standing around in one spot. You know, a regenerative bag is big on moving everything. So what happens is you end up like by, by satisfying nature cycles, by satisfying the animal's needs, you end up with a product in the end that also satisfies your end user's needs more. And that comes through beautifully so in flavor. Think about a homegrown tomato. You, you can take the same seed from a cardboard tomato at HEB and put it in your garden. Next season, that is going to taste amazing because you raised it the right way. Regenerative Ag is that concept. You've now raised a chicken the right way and it's going to taste amazing. It's full of nutrients and full of uh, minerals and higher in omega-3, so healthier fat, so you can eat all that tasty fat. So that's the general premise, is when you're raising a things, these things right, they actually just get more nutrient-dense and better flavor. I don't think I've ever had regenerative farmed chicken. I don't think I've had regenerative farmed meat. Yeah. The closest I can think of that which is not even from a farm, was when my grandpa who was alive would go hunting. Right. And he would bring back That's what he right. hunted. That's right. And they would go, ooh, it's so gamey. And I go, is it the fact that it's gamey or the fact that that's how meat should taste when it's living in the wild? Because they're having a much more, uh, the, the variety of diet. It's not just cornmeal and right. soy product. Some of these things are an acquired taste. Look, like I've acquired a taste for grass-finished beef. I think it tastes way better than- I have had grass-finished corn corn finished beef but if you're a corn finished person you you know you're missing the 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 su the suppleness and the you know um the and, and what do you call it Amam, umami. umami kind of flavor of the fat right yeah but if you have properly raised grass finished i think you're getting both flavor and fat but there's maybe a little more of an acquired taste what's cool about the chicken yeah, it's what's cool about the chicken is that it just tastes better. Like there's no acquired taste. Like it's like a homegrown tomato. It just tastes better. So it's like more chickeny. You kind of can't argue with that. It just sells itself. You just try it and like it. And whereas like grass finished, if you're into grain, I can't really convince you that grass finished is better, right? No matter how good the ethics are. So if I wanted to buy your chickens, because I've never had mm -hmm. regenerative farm chicken, and one of my sons is not a fan of chicken. Yeah. Anymore. He goes, hey, it doesn't, you rather yeah. eat beef all day, right? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, look at you, little Viking. And uh, and he also likes to tear it up. Like, like nice. that. And uh, his name is Axel. So I'm like, you you are <laughs> super scam, <scandalous>, man. <laughs> but how would I go about that? Do I buy a whole chicken? Do I buy like, do I buy chicken legs? Yeah. Meat? yeah. How, how does that yeah. work? Because yeah. I've never purchased yeah. regenerative farmed meat. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've been to farmers markets where they have yeah. the pieces of the cow. Yeah. But buying a whole cow size wise is a massive. But buying a chicken, I could hold that in my hand. You know what I'm saying? You can buy a whole chicken. Yeah. And then you could just carry yeah. more as you want. Yeah. So how, do, how, how does this work at the farmers market? I'm just curious. I mean, you know, it's like store bought chicken anywhere. You can get the cuts, you can get the boneless, skinless breasts. And if you put those in your Caesar salad rat, they're going to just taste a thousand times better than your 
previous Caesar salad wrap. You know, you can do it like that. You can you can do your like marinade, whatever you're used to. But yeah, yeah like I think the whole chicken tastes the best. If you're going to try to like get your kid onto it, yeah. I think like cooking up a whole chicken and cooking it really nicely, cooking it like they say 165 is like where you just the threshold and the internal temperature. A lot of people will stop there because they want the breasts to be nice and juicy. But I say you go to like 185, 190 because you really want the dark meat to like fall off the bone. So I think you cook the whole bird for the dark meat, not the light white meat. And I actually feel that the dark meat has the most flavor. Yes. Anyways, chicken, you know what's funny? Is he loves chicken breast, but he won't do chicken thighs. And the, the, the rest of our family, my oldest son, my wife and I were like, why are you not liking this chicken thighs? Yeah. Like, that's to me has more flavor. Yeah. And growing up, we didn't eat anything outside of chicken breast when it came to chicken. Right. It wasn't until I got older where I started getting friends that were chefs, right? Yeah. And they started telling me like, oh no, you want flavor. You go with this. Go dark one. What? Yep. And sure enough, it is... The best part. So if I'm at a Thanksgiving party and there's a chunky, I'm like, give me the dark meat. That's give me the thigh, give me the wing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, you can like cook a whole bird and you can chop off, like get the wing nice and crispy. You could take the wing off and give that to your kid if he likes eating off bones and gnawing through yeah. skin <laughs> and stuff. But then you could also take the drumstick off, you know, and then he's got his like club, his, his uh, Thor club and he can... You know, get into that. My son is more like the delicate type. He likes the breasts. And so, you know, that's, I pull that off and like give him, chop it up for him. So he doesn't have to like kind of look at the the animal looking parts, you know, he just gets like a couple pieces of meat. But I will tell you that like, now that my kids have eaten our chicken a lot, what won't go to waste is like, they're like, no matter what, they want some skin. Skin's my favorite So they're part. like... <laughs> I do uh, so no matter what <laughs> you know it's so good. daughter likes the dark meat son likes the white meat but everyone's like crispy skin i want the crispy skin they're all fighting <laughs> how, how, how do you crispy, crispy skin dude the stuff that arthur made when we collaborated on a dish for this field guide fest a couple months ago yeah arthur crushed it and he like took the skin off the thighs and roasted it for a while and then seared that and then made that into a crumble and crumbled the skin back on top of the dish at the end. Mm -hmm. It was out of this world. He, yeah, it was total art, piece of art. I don't know, like I'm not a chef, but what I what I do is cook the whole bird and cook it at 350 and cook it well. And like the whole upper side of the bird that's exposed just gets super crispy and beautiful. And like that fat is good for you now because that bird was raised healthy. So it's yeah. like, eat that stuff. You know, yeah. it's full. The reason it tastes so good is because it's full of nutrition. I, well, I like that you said, like, this is how I cook it. I'm not a chef because most of us who are listening and doing things are not chefs. Yeah. So I think the more, the more pedestrian like, right. way you do it is probably the most relatable. Right. Like a good recipe is a good recipe. Right. right. And if, it, if you can do it once, right. that's awesome. You do it twice, that's great. If you do it three times, that's where you just go to. Right. Nice. You know? So I, I like, I wanted to know because I will absolutely be wanting to purchase a whole chicken yeah and i want to test this out i want to see yeah. how it tastes i love cooking you can't go wrong with the whole bird and the like the the premise of um animal fats being like a problem and something you know is just i think is just completely wrong because we've been treating our animals wrong and i try to tell people like all the drippings in the bottom of the plant of like don't waste any of that like get the drippings that you've cooked when you've cooked a whole bird there's drippings in the bottom of the pan like yeah. first of all just either put some wine in there and like reduce it for a minute and dip your stuff in there or just stick your meat in there and mop it up off the bottom of the pan like do not throw that stuff out that is all the flavor it's the same thing with pasta like when you get done cooking the pasta water you want to say oh nice some of the starch water because that actually helps bind the pasta and the sauce and mm -hmm. actually helps make it because of starch right, right i didn't understand this because when my friend anna she's from tuscany she was showing how to make pasta carbonara she's like you she's like never throw away all of the water you keep some of it and nice. just kind of ladle some in and tell the consistency these sorts of things nice. out my buddy Lucas from Rome, he told me the same thing. My buddy Alessandro from Milan, and they all do this. And then I asked Spencer why, my friend, you know, chef, and he's like, oh, yeah, because this was starch. And he explains it like why it works. Right. So I needed to know because I'm a goofball like that. And so when you're talking about the drippings, like the drippings are the most underused, right. underrealized tasting mechanism. Right. So, um, I mean, that's, that's to where gravy comes from. That's like, you know, it's the best. I know when anytime we use our crock pot, not crock pot or Instapot for something, right? And we're getting all this great flavor. Mm -hmm. 
we'll take all the meat out, shred it for doing something like that. And then I'll usually try and find a way to reduce it and turn it into some sort of like delicious sauce. And I mean, with the meat back can Yeah. And drown it. The flavor nice. is way more intense. Yeah. It's everything. It, it tastes the way it smells. Like we can yeah. walk yeah. in to a house that has something delicious being cooked. You can smell it from the first, you know, right. minute you open the door. Right. But does the food always translate to the flavor? Right. And our nose and our mouths are connected, right? You know, the olfactory and all that. So like when you're, when you're going through and you're eating the food, I'm always like, does it taste the way it smells? And I realized the best way for me to do that is to just start using all of it, the drippings included. Nice. I feel like I've totally wrapped your head around regenerative ag yet. So I'm kind of feel like I should be illustrating this a little bit more. Do you feel that way? Is that? Well, I mean, I think you provided a really great talking point is that what we're, what we're eating. And if you're enjoying the food you're eating, mm-hmm. particularly chicken, your, your, your flavor profile is like in a five out of mm-hmm. 10. And you're mm-hmm. just getting half the flavor. Mm-hmm. It's the difference when you get store-bought sour milk, mm-hmm. but then you have something that makes it fresh. Right. Um, if you've ever, if like anybody's ever been to a restaurant where they make the pasta in house, yeah, why do you go there? Right, right. Because it's made fresh, right, daily. right, right. Nice. And we can, I think most people can relate to fresh pasta daily, and, right? And you go, wow, that that pasta is so much better. Well, well, why? Right. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing that I feel like I haven't connected to the dots is like, what what is the technique that allows this to actually like? That's what I come know. through. You know, like so what? So the general function, like the the general function that gets you to like that makes your farming regenerative is moving the animals. You can do regenerative farming and raise corn and raise crops. There's other ways, things you, you can raise, anything you can farm, you can farm regeneratively. But with generally speaking with the animals, you are moving them and rotating them okay. to new grass. With crops, you are like rotating crops and mixing instead of just having corn, you mix it with other things. And then you're also cycling in cover crops. So it's all about this kind of like changing the environment for the for the soil okay and not just having like the same thing happening over and over and over again in the same spot that's kind of the general way that we get this to work so can i move on there yeah because i remember hearing about from my i have a couple of clients years ago who owned wineries and they were talking yeah. about how there's the on season and off season uh-huh. the land, that you have to let the land right get its nutrients that's right because you yeah. over from the same land right you end up with product but it's not as good like right. the spinners we're buying in grocery stores now has 50 percent minerals and vitamins in it yep. did in the 1940s right. 50s because we've been over right. right yep am i connecting the right pieces on? absolutely okay yeah yep cool hang on let me do this really Yeah. So like the, you know, the, the bread basket in the middle of the country is like, no, you know, known for growing corn and all of our crops and stuff. Right. It was just, we had this massive store of topsoil when we got here, it wasn't just nature. It was nature combined with like indigenous people's, uh, practices, which were supportive of, of nature. Like reports were of like, you could, you could tie the you could tie the um, tops of the grasses together across the saddle as you rode through the fields of just natural grasses that were out there, right? So nature in its like own rhythm will build soil and build habitat, animals and a ton of grass and a ton of biomass. So we come in and we start growing corn on the soil and, and growing one thing only every year and not letting the soil like restore and build nutrients by having like manure come back on it. And now like you watch soil just go literally run off as the rain comes in. It can't hold the rain and it just gets washed off into the street and soil is just, this is what created the Dust Bowl in the 30s. So like soil is just exposed everywhere. So you're physically losing soil and you're also just not rebuilding soil because the soil doesn't have a, um, the cycles of nature don't have a chance to like restore. The cycles were an animal like descends on a piece of land in a herd and they eat grass and they poop, you know, manure and urine, as we understand it is good for the soil, right? In the right proportions. Isn't it like like ammonia and methane, mindful or methane? Methane, yeah. These things that are being villainized because we've thrown them in feedlots and overdo it are actually really good in nature. So let's go back to that, right? You know, a herd of bison descends on a piece of land. They're going to um, trample it. They're going to eat it. They're going to put manure on it. And they're only going to be there for a short period of time because they've got predators coming behind them. They're always on the move. That piece of land that got kind of like 
decimated by the herd. Now there's no herd on there for probably months mm -hmm. before like a, the next herd happens to come through and deposit the same, you know, experience onto that land. So the land has actually now had a chance, the soil's had a chance to use the manure, the grass has had a chance to actually rebound, the roots have had a chance to grow deeply. So now actually, actually everything is like healed up nicely and the forage is more rich because it's got manure in it. Now the next herd comes in and they're eating more uh, nutrient dense forage. And they're going through the same process of dropping their manure and blah, blah, blah. So what happens is the land gets this like rest and recuperation and then intense impact, rest and recuperation, intense impact. And as it does that, it's actually building soil as the roots grow back and the soil and the grass grows. That's the word I'm looking for. Grass grows nice and tall and thick. It's actually re reintroducing all the minerals and stuff into the soil. So there's this process of like growth and rejuvenation and then animal impact which is what builds soil, builds good forage, and builds healthy animals. So that's nature's cycle. But what we do is we put animals in an enclosed yard, and there's no rotation. They're in the same spots all the time, so they're over-pooping in the same spots. They're over-grazing in the same spots. Mm -hmm. And now the, re the rest never comes. So grass gets eaten, and it, as it starts to grow back and get roots and get tall again, the animal comes right back over and eats it again. So what happens is the grass gets stunted, right? If the animal's always there, the grass doesn't get a chance to actually like re-root and grow tall. It gets stunted, it gets stunted, it gets stunted. What grows now instead are the weeds that the animal doesn't even want to eat because it leaves them. So now you've gone from like stimulating good quality grasses to stimulating the weeds. You've taken this thing that nature had built beautifully and now you're killing it by putting a fence around and telling it really they can't move. Does that make sense? Totally. So, so what regenerative ag would do is you take that same piece of land and instead of just leaving the animals in the same spots all the time, you make smaller paddocks within the land and you say, okay, you can eat here today and now you can eat here tomorrow and you can eat here the next day, but you can't go back. And so now we reintroduce that rhythm of animal impact and rest. So by the time you rotate through your whole property, the, the piece of land you started on has a chance to actually rest and recuperate. And now again, you've got that deep root growth, tall grass growth, and more nutrient-dense grass yeah. because you reintroduce that period of rest as you come around. Because uh, you're a first-generation farmer. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to my previous guest, Jeff. He's talking about how an average age of most of these farmers that he that are in his district that he uh, advocates on behalf yeah are close to retiring so right 60 yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. i mean you're just what a good 15 maybe you know 20 years younger than the average yeah uh, Sandler, do you find that regenerative farming like the like the people who are getting involved that are first generation, generation mm -hmm. which is which is an amazing thing because I think we're so used to hearing I'm a fourth or fifth or oh, yeah. sixth generation farmer. We're not hearing first generation farmer. You're actually the first person I've met right. that said this. Right. Or I've even heard about first generation farmer. Are you connecting with other first generation farmers? And I'm just curious, like, what's the average age of a yeah. first generation farmer? Yeah, there's there, you're sorry, it's a loaded question. You're hitting on like a thing that it's a problem. The um I think I'm probably on like the upper end of that age range. I think probably 45 to 25 yeah. is probably the, the range. But there is definitely this thing happening where it's like uh, farmers are one of the oldest, in terms of the oldest, the average age of a farmer, it's like the oldest of any um, industry. Yeah, of any yeah. job, of any industry. It's also the highest suicide rate of any job. What? Yeah. Farmers, Wait, high rate of suicide. Why? Because why? the industrialized system is screwing the farmers. The farmer becomes this kind of like peg, this pawn in this grand scheme of how you have to farm. And they get stuck and they are not, they're, they're not, the, they're, they know they're hurting the soil. Mm -hmm. They're watching their family get sick from all the stuff they're spraying all over. They're not actually like in charge of their own destiny because they have to raise crops a certain way at a certain at a certain place, you're in, not indebted, but you're in, you have a certain way that like, in order to get the loans, you have to do it a certain way. In order to get the insurance, you have to like do it a certain, you know, so you're like, I didn't know you you have to follow these protocols. Everyone's wow. kind of forcing you to do it a certain way. And it's also not really a livable wage. And so there's everyone that's in the farmer's family, they're kind of leaving farming because they see that it's like so hard and not really helpful to the family. 
And then the farmers are left in this really stuck place where like there's the land, they have the land hopefully, but there's no one to give the land to. So there's this problem with farmers aging out and having nowhere to go to get no one to give the land to. And then there's this problem of the people who are raised around it, not wanting to do it. Yeah. And then this problem of the people who now want to do it like me, but want to do it differently. How do we find the land and get connected to these people who are aging out, you know, to actually like support each other, you know? So there's, there's multiple problems going on there. I've talked to a few people who are in the restaurant world, either they be chefs, restaurant tours, they, they, they work in large restaurant groups with yeah. manage multiple places. They all want to use local farmers. They want to use local produce. They want to use the local meats and they want to do it in the most ethically sourced, not because of the selling, but because they also understand that the, the food content is better too. Yeah. It's better nutrients, better flavor, right? Some of them, funny enough, who don't know each other, to my knowledge, have all said it would be really great if the local cities were to do some sort of, um, what's that word? Subsidies. Subsidies, yes. Yeah, yeah. Where the local government would provide subsidies for restaurants right. and farmers yes. to work together. Right. And they're saying if we do this, not only would we support a local economy that would be really strong and yeah. vibrant, they said the the quote side effect of the, the the thing that would produce out of it is you'd have a population who's eating out at restaurants that's already not going to cook at home, mm -hmm. and they're probably not going to make mm -hmm. right. They're probably going to you know throw the the chicken tenders in the microwave and yeah. call it a day, right? You're now giving them better access yeah. to better food yep. at a lower price, and they're like, ergo, you're going to have a healthier population. That's probably not going to have a lot of chronic disease from. The yes. use of certain products that you, you need to just to yeah. make your overhead lower in a restaurant. And I was thinking like, I really love this idea of a local subsidies partnership between yeah. the local farmers and restaurants. If it means that we, the consumer, get a better product for less money because nobody's going to pay or people just historically are not inclined to invest in food because they don't see the value of it. Mm -hmm. They see the value of having the new iPhone yeah. as a status symbol, but no yeah. one talks about like, oh, by the way, do you know that my plaque level on my arteries right. is down lower because right. I've made these choices. Like right. health is not, your your uh, food choice is not really quite associated yet to other things. Right. You, you oh, yeah. With this? oh yeah. Yeah, like the status of good status. Health. Yeah, exactly. The status of, you know, like, oh, well, you go to like fancy restaurants. Yeah. Well, we're not really going to fancy restaurants. We're eating that picnic yeah. because there's no seed oil. So yeah. Making a choice to spend right. more money yeah. on something that's going to do us better yeah. food because somebody said, you know, you pay for it one way or the other. Right, exactly. Eat shitty food, get shitty health, you're going to have high medical costs. Right. Pay a little bit more for better quality food. You're probably going to have a lower medical costs at the end of the day because you're not abusing your body. Right. And yeah. I, I just want to know, like, you know, since you are on that side of the founder, would you, is that, how does that? Sounds, per, sounds beautiful. That's, 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 uh, you know, a major part of the problem is that the, the people can't afford this food, um, the good stuff, uh, because the, there's no subsidies. There's no help for the farmers. You're paying realistic prices for things that are raised with extra management. You know, the extra management of moving the animal around. Yeah. The, I buy the cleanest, healthiest, most local organic food I can for my birds. It's expensive, but it's like that's how you get to have a good product and it, you have to pay for it. Whereas like the stuff that's grown the wrong way and these mass scales, yeah, the farmers aren't making any money. So they get a they get a check for not making any money. They get subsidized by the government. That's why your chicken at the grocery store costs two fifty a pound. It's totally yeah. like... Um, you know, suppressed pricing. It's not real pricing because there are subsidies and it, you know, it's kind of the system's designed that the farm's not actually able to make money. So we write them a check so that they can stay alive. You know, that's the way it works. It's so if they could do that locally to support real food, that'd be like a absolute, like absolutely like stunning. Yes. Just, if the chicken farms weren't being subsidized on the federal level, these, yeah. these you know, giant, yeah. giant, conglomerate baseless corporations, right? Mm -hmm. The price of chicken would be much higher. Right. Would it be close to the same price point that you're selling your meat at? You know, I don't know enough about the way they raised, I don't know enough about the details of the industrial industry to tell you what the price point would be exactly, but it would just, it would be in a much more- Competitive. Market. Yeah, much more competitive. That's all I needed to know. Then 
it's gut instinct yeah. is like, I don't know the numbers, but let's say, you know, you're buying it to, for $2 a pound and your meat is like four fifty a pound. That's a, that or no, no, it'd be like $8 a pound. Right. But then if you take out the subsidies and it's really like five fifty a pound. Right. Exactly. That's what it's, it's the whole point of like, yes, for 25 cents more, I will super exactly. my bill. Exactly. Why would you not? Why would you not? Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Yeah, it would, you'd at least be in the same ballpark. I mean, this was part one of the, the resonate. Okay, one of the experiences that like resonated with me as I started getting into this like cleaner foods production was being abroad in, you know, 20 years ago, not interested in farming or health food, just being abroad and having, uh, an ex- you know, the experience of eating food in Italy in a culture that kind of like sets its values at a different level you can go to a corner store, um, you know, let's see, like be, you, the, the equivalent of like road trip food in Italy is like insanely high quality stuff. You know, I was yeah. sitting at like, I was sitting on a, um, what do you call it? What is the boat that goes uh, across to an island? Um, to uh, uh, either, you're on a boat. You're on a fair, boat. The ferry, yeah, right? Ferries. It's kind of like a commuting, a commuter dock kind of thing. I was sitting on a ferry boat. I was sitting on a dock waiting for a ferry boat, you know, and we were just like, oh, we're like, oh, we got, we better get lunch, you know? We hadn't thought about it. Uh, okay, there's a deli right across the street. Boom, let's walk over there and just whatever we can get, we can get. We had like four bucks in our pocket. We go in there. We just like tell them, no, we need a sandwich. And they, we kind of have a little chat with them. The next thing we know, we like have our bag. We run out, run out of the ferry. And a half an hour later, we're sitting at the top of the ferry, like opening up this bag. We take a bite of this fa- sandwich and it's just like the most, the most delicious, you know, caprese salad sandwich you've ever had in your life. Yeah. Like just amazing prosciutto on it. You know, we just spent like four fifty each and it's like, I would have had to spend, that would be like an $18 sandwich in the U.S., you know? Oh, yeah. You would have had to be, you could only find it if you were like a premium like neighborhood and, yeah. you know. And uh, this is not what you get at the corner store at the at the ferry before you hop on because you hadn't thought about it until the last minute. I was just like, damn, you know, this this is where it was like became very obvious that it's just like this sense of it's about the it's about the culture's values. Like they value this stuff enough that they're not going to allow the crap, the crap to get produced cheaply. You, so what ends up happening is if everything's being produced on this high level, the prices come down. Uh, because um, everything infrastructure wise gets designed around supporting that higher quality, right? So if we all start just like taking our money away from the the really, you stop supporting the really cheap terrorist stuff. Right now, it takes you know, right now it costs five times more to to stop buying the cheap stuff. But if we all stop buying the cheap stuff, it would only cost one time more, two times more than, you know what I mean? Like you're saying, it would go from $2 versus $8 a pound to $5 versus $8 a pound. I'm going to buy the $8 thing. That's nice. That's yeah. Or you buy the $8 thing more often. Yeah. Maybe not every day, but still right. more frequent purchases. Right. I remember during uh, the pandemic thing is like when everyone was talking about the price of uh, eggs. Yeah. So like, oh my God, eggs are like $4. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know the efficacy compared to like, obviously I know yours going to be far more, you know, better but like we would buy battle farms right and they've always been six seven dollars in uh right the card and everyone's like can you believe eggs are like five dollars and i was like you know for a dollar fifty (laughs) more you could get battle farms and they're like i'm already complaining and like so my wife and i always joke around and the price increase we're like if we've been buying organic like pasture raised you know grass-fed grass fed grass you've been buying this for years so we're like and, and those things, I don't feel have jumped up exponentially as some of the other stuff. There has been a price increase, but like, right. it's just been funny to us because people are complaining about things that we've been buying for years. Right. Oh, like, uh, that's what we've been, we realize most of our monthly income, a lot of it goes to food, mm. but it's also real food. Right. We're off, we noticed that since the last couple of months, we've really made a conscious choice to remove things out of our diet, like yeah. all the seed oils, for yeah. instance, we find added sugar anything that has a food coloring or dye in it, right? Mm. I say, if you take, if you focus on those three things, yeah. your diet radically shifts, but we're also not snacking. We don't have this yeah. weird hunger for stuff. Right. And our kids, they don't get it. And they're like, you're, that's so bad. You're not giving your kids all the, the cake at a birthday party. Mm. And I'm like, you know what? They don't really need that amount of sugar, you know? Right. And we make ice cream for them. 
Right. Well, we make homemade ice cream. That's awesome. With raw cream and honey and real flavors. We're using real cacao or we're using mm-hmm. real vanilla. We're using real peppermint. You know, we're using real ingredients. Mm-hmm. Like I have to learn how to make a strawberry jam preserve because the way I'm currently reducing the strawberries mm-hmm. is turning it more into a sorbet. Mm-hmm. And so I need to figure out how to get that creaminess. <laughs> so like my next thing is like, how do I make natural jam? Nice. It, it, and for me, it's like, it's a, it's an interest. It's a hobby. You know, we are not like snacking. Like we're not just That's awesome. looking for like, let's go grab some keyboard of cooking. It's like, we're just with those things have just, yeah, that's great. It's man. amazing. When you change your diet, you stop snacking. You start wanting to eat crap food yeah that's amazing it's achievement because the kids it's really tough because they're just exposed to so many other things outside your house and it's a fast-paced world that's not designed for us to be thinking too hard about what we eat or have time for meal prep it's it's a challenge so yeah no that's amazing that you're doing that and be able to really get your kids on that kind of thing because i am i am really making changes like that myself but i you know i'm having a tough time getting the family you know dragged along with me so well, I'll say one thing. I'm very lucky with my wife that we are completely in lockstep yeah. together and we have two kids. Uh, we jokingly say that we brainwash them to understand what's that's good health wise. They hear us talk about it, they repeat yeah. it. They're like, well, we can't have that. That has a seed oil. No, like, which cool. seven year old is talking about seed oil? It's my son. And my five year old's like, well, we can't have that. That's added refined sugar. It's just really funny. Even like making their lunches, we make their lunches fresh. Yeah. And we have these, my wife found these lunches that you're able to keep the food warm for a long period of time. Yeah. And by the time that they go to school and they have their lunch, it's not that far of a time. So the food is still warm. Mm-hmm. And so we are every morning, I'm like, all right, we're going to, you know, I'm like, I'm out there at like 6, 15 in the morning grilling fresh chicken. <laughs> you know, that's what we're doing. That's amazing. We're, we're nuts. You know, I'll admit it. We're completely nuts. I, everybody always talks about wanting to give their kids a better life than what they had for us. That is providing them with a uh, a better health future. Yeah. So that way they don't have a potential chronic yeah. disease or chronic illness that could have been prevented just by, you know, removing something that had those loaded in glyphosate, even though they say glyphosate is safe. So I'm I'm stoked that you do this. Thanks. Um, can, now do you have like a like a drop off? Are you okay? So I didn't even know this. When you do your farmers market here in Austin, are you at the same farmers markets? Do you provide to restaurants? Are there restaurants that use your chickens it, that people could go like, look, I want to support restaurants that do this. Mm-hmm. Like how could somebody who's maybe listening, who's from Austin, and, and obviously the podcast is beyond Austin, right? Because it a podcast goes everywhere. How could someone find yeah. where your chickens go to? Or if they're like, let's say they're in California yeah. or they're in North Carolina, yeah. are there networks of where people can find they're local regenerative farmers. Yeah. You know, I am two and a half years into it and still growing. So I am like not growing at a volume that can supply a f- restaurant very well. I'm just kind of getting there. So my wholesale accounts are with small scale grocers, food co-ops that do like CSAs. What's CSAs? Community supported agriculture. Okay. Thank you. So people, <laughs> people will um, sign on to have like a vegetable share delivered once a month from the CSA and, or a chicken share or a beef share. They'll, get, they'll sign on for multiple months where they get deliveries of farm fresh stuff. Yeah. So I'll supply them. So that's me personally. You know, like people that are doing what I do are supplying your, yes, are supplying your local farm to table restaurants. They're able to supply your local, you know, small scale food co-op grocer. If you've got one of those in your town, like yeah. you can find this kind of chicken and beef in your home town. Looks good. Yeah, I think we're done, man. I'm just going to clean up a little bit of all the little, this little stuff. Cool. But uh, good, man. thanks, dude. Thank you, man. Thank you. Like, you can answer a lot of questions so far. So anyways, you're talking about like where they can find local chicken. Yeah, so you can find it. You can find your local. You can find local regenerative chicken and you know any product in those kind of like grocers. You can also like the farmers market is always a great place. It's all about like asking the questions. Like, do you support regenerative farms? Do you specifically buy from regenerative farms? And if you're also Looking specifically for regenerative farms, there are things like GetRealChicken.com, which is the national pasture-raised chicken producers' um, like interactive map that will show you where local farms that are registered near you are growing this kind of food. There are some registries like that that would get you to this type of food. 
But any you know, any like Google search of like regenerative farms near me or pasture raised chickens near me or pasture raised meat near me will get you to local farmers. And I think most regenerative farmers will tell you the number one thing to do is find someone local who's doing it this way, you know? And the next best thing you can do is like find someone local who's close to doing it this way. And the next best thing you can do is like find someone not local who's regenerative that you can buy and have shipped to you. The order of preference is like local, support local clean organic stuff. You wanna help build resiliency to your food system. Like you wanna support multiple local small scale farmers, not one big mainstream company. So the more you can break it down into those finer elements, you're getting a more um, healthier base on which you're gonna stand. If something goes wrong to the supply chain, there's more resilience if you've got a bunch of local people doing it. You wanna keep the local farmers in business and it's going to be a better, healthier product for you if you're buying it in your area because it's something that can actually be grown there. And you're not, you know, growing strawberries in the middle of the winter you're you you know you're you're getting it from people who are growing things in season in the way they're supposed to be done i've actually seen a couple of diets that people talk about when i say diets not to like lose weight diets because i think people actually i think most people don't understand the true definition of what a diet is a diet is what you're eating a diet is not something you do you're yeah, doing yeah, yeah. a diet yeah which is consuming food right one of the things that I remember Rena said, somebody was saying you should only eat the food that is in season, yes. that is in your area. And yes. you want to have the most natural diet, how you would have it. Like when people talk about the paleo diet, yeah. they're doing all this stuff. And then they started turning to counting macros and then turning into this keto thing. But I remember somebody said, like, if you're going to do paleo, you need to do paleo in season. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was actually a really eye opening idea. Like, hey, turnips are in the season right now. Time to eat turnips. And I I remember that, that, that winter, I made my Thanksgiving dinner with only food that was in season. And funny enough, it was almost everything you'd have right. in a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. And it made me think like, you should only be, like, should you be buying that? Um, right. And I was like, I should probably start looking at all the things, like if it's in season, you eat a lot of it when it's in season. And when it's not in season, make me switch to something else. Right. You know, no, totally. So yeah, at some point the blueberries just aren't the same blueberries, right. you know, you gotta, uh, yeah. With your hair, I just followed the, the way your hair likes to move. I'm not oh, yeah. trying to fight it. Like you came in here with it dry the way it was. It has a little bit of this little lip here, uh-huh. front, little flip. Uh-huh. And uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to like cut this up. So if these pieces come forward, uh-huh. they don't have this really long piece, which makes it look like you're trying to hide something. I so I figured it's always nicer to keep the front hairline more short and concise where it actually has a start and end. Cause when you start getting the long pieces hanging uh-huh. out, it looks like you're trying to hide. Right, right, right. And you're not, your hairline's fine, dude. Great. So like, that's, a, that's about Love it. it. Love it, very uh, thoughtful. Looks great. Looks cool. like a thoughtful haircut. I try to be thoughtful. Uh, anyways, Ryan, thank you so much. I'm actually looking forward to buying a chicken from you. I've always wanted to eat regenerative farmed meat. I have guests had that option. I mean, I obviously could have bought things online. Right. Is it? No. But there's something that makes me feel better about doing something local. Yeah. I, I think if anybody's curious, they needed to start doing their own research about where do you find these things where you're at. Yeah. Um, I know I've turned a lot of people on to looking for raw milk. Yeah. Which is a very polarizing topic for a lot of people. But I can only praise the good things that it's done for me. Right. Um, and you'd be surprised how many people, many of my friends who are lactose intolerant or claim to be. Yeah. Are like, oh, my God, I actually don't have these issues anymore. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's not weird. Yeah. Like, I mean, eat things in a snap form. Well, you know, the, the other thing about the local versus industrial that we didn't touch on, but is another really yeah. big point. We have to just <laughs> <laughs> when things get bigger and more you know, further away from you, yeah. there's just less accountability. And like, yeah. I just recently heard from someone who's very entrenched and knows a lot of people around the state, has uh, a military background. So he's also like, I think hearing some people from people like that, that like all of the organic vegetables that we're getting in Texas, when they hit the state line, actually get sprayed with pesticides. They legally have to. And they're stamped with organic and, f- and given to us as organic. Wow. All of the effort and time you're going through to get that stuff at HEB or whatever, one of the yeah. big retailers, it might be wasted because you just have no idea what kind of bureaucratic nonsense is going on behind the scenes. Where When you go to the farmer's market and you look someone in the eye and they're telling you this stuff is clean, you can believe it, you know? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and you, or you can choose to not believe it or believe it based on like something that's really direct and real. It's a totally different relationship. No one has accountability. No one's looking you at the eye in H-E-B and can promise you where this stuff came from. They don't, they don't know. Not to mention you can't visit those farms either. Exactly. I think, it's, I think if you're a local farmer and you're a consumer, we, there's this one family and they produce uh, meat, like long, long, no, steermorn, long steer, the, the ones, I forget. What yes, longhorn. Longhorn. They're like, yeah, come down to the, come down to the farm. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, the, that is the ultimate transparency. Yeah. Open door. Come on, check it out. Yep. You want to see how we do it? And, and it's not like just showboat. It's like, we got nothing. Nothing to hide. Yep. Totally. If somebody won't let you on their farm. That's a, that's that's a weird, good. that's a, it's a suspect name, totally. you know? <laughs> totally. So it's like reintroduce the, just the direct connection, yeah. looking someone in the eye that's actually raised the animals and felt grief for their loss. You know, it's like, it's a totally different thing when there's responsibility for what's being done and for the deaths. I mean, it's like, you know, get closer to you, get closer to your food and get closer to your food makers. You know, we're talking about a couple of things that made me think of this one phrase I saw, I saw, I said, why is it called biohacking and alternative food eating here in America? But in other countries, it's just yeah. eating. Like we have to seek out. Yeah all the things to get food in this most purest natural yeah. farm, you know, to get out of all the, yeah. the crap we don't want. And it's like, when they always say, well, that's the conventional fruit and that's the organic fruit. I'm like, shouldn't organic be, be conventional? Yeah. And shouldn't it be like conventional is organic and anything outside of that is it's unconventional. Weird. And we, exactly, it's weird. Here's our conventional meats <laughs> and our fucking weird meats are over here. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. So, um, where can people, and work just give, give, People, your details. So yeah, the, the company is Geosman Regenerative Farm. Okay. And you can find the website at gregenerative.com. Order locally for Austinites. You can order online, free delivery. And you can always find me at the Boggy Creek Farm Stand and the Downtown Farmers Market and the Sunset Valley Farmers Markets on Saturdays. For now, the Central Texas Food Co-op is where you can also get these subscriptions, these CSA subscriptions. Okay. Um, so that's another source where you can find me. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure. It. Like, I, Tab, I nice meeting you. Man, this is, these are the kind of things that I love. And these are the kind of conversations where people would sit in my chair and they just do something like, I, I want to know more about this. Cool, man. Yeah, man. Well, your haircut's amazing too. And I, you know, it was really, I felt in good hands. So I hope you can enjoy one of the chickens and feel like as I, you got as good of an experience as I did. I believe, I believe, uh, I believe that's going to be the case. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. Thanks, Tab. Later.